Today, we're going to talk about process validation, but not just any process validation. We're going to talk about process validation for a process that you can't find a standard for. What do you do then? So in the medical device industry, in a 510k submission, you have to provide um, a process validation for sterilization. Sometimes you have to provide it for other things, but normally for the manufacturing process, that's only covered internally and then inspected during an FDA inspection. When you're submitting a technical file for CE marking, they want to see that process validation documentation. They want to see a process flow for the entire manufacturing process. They want to have on that process flow references to your detailed work instructions, to your procedures. They want a copy of that validation, and it has to be thorough. So you need a complete validation protocol. You need a validation report. You need the raw data. And they want it summarized for them so they don't have to read all that stuff. They'll ask for those documentation if they don't have enough answers in the summary that you wrote. And they call that a STED, a summary technical document. They want you to identify what standard you used, which comes in my point of doing this webinar or, or live streaming uh, video for a process where you don't have a standard. But if you have a standard, they want you to reference the standard that you used. What were the acceptance criteria? What were the conditions that you used? Um, what were uh, what was your justification for your sample size? And then a summary of the data, any deviations that you had. All that's supposed to be covered in your summary technical document for CE marking. But if you have a novel process, you don't have a standard to go by. So what do you do? And if you don't have a, uh, a standard to go by, you're going to have to submit your entire protocol and your entire report and all the data, and they're going to spend a lot more time reviewing it. And as technology moves, you're going to have new processes. Somebody's going to be innovative, and somebody's going to have to create that first validated process. So if that's your company, that's your intellectual property, uh, you have developed a new manufacturing process or a new material, let's say it's a coating for an orthopedic implant or something, you're going to have to come up with that new process validation. And unfortunately, people just don't know how to do it. They're like, well, if it's not sterilization, I just don't repeat it a half cycle three times. I don't know what to do. So um, there are two ways you can go about this. There's the fast, efficient way that costs more money. And then there's the slow brute force way where you do it yourself. So we'll start with the assumption that you're a do-it-yourselfer. <laughs> so if you're a do-it-yourselfer, buy this book. <laughs> I don't make any royalties off it. Uh, Max Sherman is the editor of the book. I contributed to the book as one of the many authors. I know personally most of the authors that wrote this book. It's a phenomenal collection of people that we included in this book. But it's a 400 page book that you buy from wraps. And if you click on the, if you look down below for the video links, uh, that'll be after this live session, you'll see the hyperlink for, um, wraps. You go on the wraps store, you type in validation handbook and you'll find this and it's available in PDF format and hard book cover that I have here. It's a second edition. We're just getting started putting together the team that's going to do the third edition. By the time we finish the rewrites and we get it actually edited and published, and it's available for you to purchase, at least a year is going to go by and possibly two. So um, there's no concern that you're getting current information. This is the best you're going to get right now in one source. Now, when you look at this book, you're going to say, holy cow, that's expensive for this book because it's almost a $300 book. It's, I think, $285 is their list price. If you're a RAPS member, which you should be, and once again, I don't get any commission from RAPS. Uh, if you're a RAPS member, you get a lot of discounts on their material, and I like to buy a lot of their books. So just my book discounts alone pay for my RAPS membership. But if you need additional training on top of that, you, RAPS is a great deal. But I think you save $80 just on this book alone with your RAPS membership. So... It doesn't take much to pay for your reps membership. So if you're a do-it-yourselfer and you need help with process validation, buy this book. That's the first step. Now, you want to become an expert in process validation? Well, you could spend 10 years like I did 
doing nothing but process validation in the pharmaceutical industry, and you'll become an expert in validating novel processes that nobody's ever seen before. Because I designed my own equipment, built my own equipment, maintained my own equipment, taught everybody how to use it, managed the pilot plant, and wrote all my own validation protocols. And it was for pharmaceutical, which is not light on documentation. <laughs> it makes medical device documentation look light. <laughs> sort of the uh, Cliff Notes version. But if you don't have 10 years to learn how to do this properly, buy the book, okay? Every night before you go to bed, and I know we're all sleeping so well with this COVID pandemic that went over the last two years, and we've got all these bad habits we've created, we can't sleep. What better way to get to sleep than sit down with an old-fashioned hardcover textbook and read 10 pages and then snore? <laughs> 10 pages. It's 400 pages long. In 45 days or less, you will have the entire book. You know, skip a day, but don't skip two days in a row. Make it a habit. Read 10 pages a day. If you miss a day, don't worry about it. Just start up the next day so you don't skip two days in a row. Read the 400 pages. By the time you're done, you will know at least double what you currently know. And it wouldn't be a bad idea for me to reread this whole thing because this stuff in here, I don't remember. I forgot it. Uh, you know, every you do this stuff for long enough after 30 years, you forget stuff. <laughs> it's been 20 years since I've been working, 22 years now since I worked in pharma and biotech. So I don't do validation protocols every day now. And I could benefit from reading this, even though I'm an author. So I'll tell you what's in it. But you can look at the, the table contents. But number one, right at the beginning, chapter two, we've got um, we've got the regulatory requirements for design and process validation. And I, I insisted, you know, we want to cover just not just process validation, but design validation because they're different and, and you handle them differently. The next thing I thought that was useful to cover in here is risk-based validation. That's chapter three. Risk-based validation is really important when you have a novel process. You identify the risks. You evaluate the risk. That means risk estimation. What is the severity of the, of the, the risks or harms or, sorry, hazards? So if something goes wrong, sorry, if something goes wrong, how long will that take? Um, how often will it happen? What, what, will, what will be the severity of something going wrong with that manufacturing process? And then the last piece is you actually implement your risk controls for the manufacturing process. And normally when you're developing a new manufacturing process, you'll try different process controls and see which ones work best. And what might work on a manual basis initially to control the process might not be scalable and, auto and worthy of automation. But you try different things and see which one gives you the most consistent process for what you're looking for. And, and that's all the that's the art of process development. And that's what I was. I was a process development engineer. And my background's chemical engineering. So I was really good at, at liquid processing and pumping and things like that and heating and pressure and stuff like that. So sterilization right up my alley. The next chapter I thought that was really useful in here is sample sizes and verification and validation. So this is chapter 14. If you need a brush up on uh, statistical methods, there's a lot of references in here to different documents for statistics to determine your sample size, but using a risk-based approach and using statistics is covered in this chapter. So this gives you an abbreviated short crash course what you need to do for your validation. Then the next thing I wanted to point out here, you know, I don't know if, how well you can see it here, but roughly half of the book is appendices. And a lot of these appendices... Don't tell reps I told you this. A lot of the appendices are free and you can download them. So if you look at their table of contents and you look at what the title is of that table of contents section, you can probably download that. So if you're really penny pinching, you're a student or you were laid off and you need to learn some process validation, look at what their table of contents is for the appendices and go look for those documents. So this first one here is a GHTF guidance document. And it's found on the IMDRF website. So that's the International Medical Device Regulators Forum. And if you bought our procedure, that's one of the documents we reference. People are like, well, I don't know how to write a validation protocol for packaging. Well, it's an example provided in that free guidance document you can download. <laughs> so do that. 
Um, don't don't pay somebody to write a packaging protocol when you can download it for free in Word format and then edit it and put your own company name on it. But there are other ones in here, and I thought I would use as an example additive manufacturing. So 3D printing, here's a chapter on 3D printing. By the FDA, you can download it for free from the FDA website. <laughs> so like I said, a lot of this stuff is free in here. And there are some really good consultants mentioned in here that you could seek for help, including myself. Um, there's in here, John Bretz wrote something on UDI. He's a UDI consultant, so how to validate UDI. Uh, another person, uh, John Lincoln, he wrote something in here on uh, validating software, I believe, and cybersecurity. So he had some stuff in here. There's some really good stuff in this book that is worth, just that one chapter is worth the hundreds of dollars you're paying and you're getting 19 chapters plus a half a book of appendices and you don't have to go hunt them all down. So if time is money for you, just buy it. And um, if you want to, not only can you follow a link, but you can also get the PDF version. So if you don't want to wait for it to ship, you can get the PDF version. And then if you're like me, you upload it to your Kindle and you can read it on your Kindle uh, in the hot tub at, at a hotel. So those are that's what I recommend if you want to learn process validation and become an expert over time. You need to practice, but you need to read a lot. So read 10 pages a night for the next 45 days, and you will know at least twice what you already know and be so much better equipped. And this book will give you some great free resources out there for protocols and things. Now, if you need a process validation procedure, I put a hyperlink down below in the video comments. So after this post, you'll see here's where you can buy our procedure for process validation. You can always write your own. And I talk about that a little bit in the regulatory section of that book. But the, the section, one of the sections in the appendices is documents from the FDA on how to do process validation. And the FDA is very specific on how they want process validation done. And they provide a lot of great detail in there. AMI has a guidance document in thir on 1345, 2016 as well. And that talks about how to do process validation. And there's lots of stuff out there on how to do process validation from the pharmaceutical industry. So you shouldn't have any trouble writing a procedure based on what's out there on how to do process validation from free sources. You should be able to cobble together your own. But if time is money, just buy ours. And if you have questions, I will also provide, I'll provide a link down below where you can schedule an appointment with me and you can ask questions and I can give you advice on how to revise your procedure or you can just buy ours. Now, how do I validate a brand new 3D printing process that's using materials that nobody's ever used before? Now, the first thing I want to dispel for everybody is you. the answer is not I do three lots and I get good passing results and I'm done. That's not the answer. Three is not a magic number. Three is what they historically did for pharmaceutical sterilization validation. They would want to see three consecutive lots, or sometimes even they would go to the extent of, well, what about non-consecutive lots? Give me three non-consecutive lots. But they wanted to see three lots that were all done at nominal conditions and you got good product. But the primary reason for that, and that was part of your PQ, the reason why you were doing that performance qualification was to show that lot to lot variability of raw materials didn't impact the quality of the product. That was the whole purpose of it. So whenever you put a bunch of corn syrup and salt and inject a microbial organism or a yeast into a tank and grow it up, you're going to have variability. And so which vat you pulled the sugar out of and pulled the salt out of and who did it and how well they measured it makes a difference. And every inoculation into a tank for the pharmaceutical industry made a difference. And when you're sterilizing a tank, how well somebody cleaned it, what went in it before, how, how long have those seals been in there be, since the last time they were replaced and cleaned, um, who did the work, because not every operator out there remembers every single little step, every valve they're supposed to turn, every button they're supposed to push in the right order they're supposed to do it. People make mistakes. So what we're looking for in a PQ is if you follow the procedure three times in a row with three different lots of raw materials and ideally three different people on three different days with maybe even three different tanks that are all identical, do we get the same results? So repeatability, reproducibility, 
nominal conditions, different people, different raw materials, different tanks. That's what we're looking for in the PQ. Now, does everybody do it that thoroughly? No. Some people use the same lot of raw materials, the same tank, the same person, and the same day. <laughs> and if it's a 15, 20 minute cycle time, yeah, you can do that and it'll work. And it'll probably get through the FDA because the standard says do three and you did three. Is that adequate for a brand new novel process that nobody's seen before? Not a chance. <laughs> you follow the standard, but when you go off reservation, you no longer have a, a standard. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to have to come up with a whole other method of doing this. So what are we going to do? Um, you have to understand first, what is an IQ? What is the purpose of an IQ? What is an OQ? What is the purpose of an OQ? And I just told you what the purpose is of a PQ. It's a performance qualification. And the purpose is to show repeatability and reproducibility for nominal conditions, to show lot-to-lot -lot variability, people variability, and equipment variability doesn't make a difference to getting good product because you have a robust process because you did an IQ and OQ. So just glossing over the IQ and OQ doesn't fly with a new process. you got to do a really robust job of the IQ and OQ. So let me step back, go to the IQ, and explain what that's about. So everybody's like, well, that's installation qualification. So I just, you know, I just make sure it's installed. Well... That's not all. <laughs> so in an IQ, it's called the installation qualification. So yes, you need to install the equipment and document the installation. Just like you, if you installed software, you have to document what, what uh, computer you're installing it on. So serial number of the computer. What is the operating system? What is the other software on the computer? What is the version of the software that I'm uploading that I'm validating? That's a lot of information about just software uploading. And that's just the installation of software on a computer, really simple. Now, when we're talking a an automated process that I have to validate that's novel, not only does the equipment have some automation, but I might have a specific program that I'm, I programmed in for step-by-step -step what the automated equipment's supposed to do. So that has to be validated. That might have different versions. So I need to install it correctly. That's all the software piece. Then we have hardware. So is it secure? Is it um, safely installed so it won't tip over? Can the floor hold the weight of the equipment um, when it moves really quickly? Because a lot of automated equipment has robotic arms. Will it deflect the floor and crack the floor? Will it flip over on itself? When it picks up something heavy, will it tip over? Those are things you got to look at. Um, is there an, when you have a gantry arm that's coming around or a robot arm coming around, will it clip somebody's head off? Um, is it, does it have adequate guarding? Do you have light curtains on the machine? These are some of the details we look at when we're doing an IQ. If you're doing a manufacturing process like a pharmaceutical process or a 3D printer process where you're working with new raw materials in a unique process, you might have to do a HAZOP. Um, a HAZOP is doing a hazard analysis of that operation. And so that's one of the risk management techniques or risk analysis techniques that almost nobody's ever trained on, but it's listed in the old 14971 guidance document, that 24971 guidance that they published in 2020 that nobody's read all through. Well, they have a HAZOP in there, and there's a whole standard out there on how to do a HAZOP, and anybody working in pharma or chemical industry has done a HAZOP, and you're trained on that. But medical device industry, no idea what a HAZOP is. But when you start... Um, heating things up to really high temperatures and doing it in a special environment, you might have to worry about safety. <laughs> so that's the purpose of a HAZOP. Next, something that we all seem to get because most of the people that work in biomedical engineering in the medical device industry are mechanical engineers by background. If they're not a biomedical engineer, they get calibration. So we understand I need to know my X, Y, Z coordinates and I need to know the tolerances. And so calibration, we seem to get pretty well. But that's something that has to be done as part of your IQ. Maintenance. You need a maintenance plan. It should be a preventive maintenance plan. It should have a documented work instruction for the preventive maintenance plan and a schedule for the preventive maintenance plan and training records for the people that are going to be doing that. And because I used to run pilot plants, the first thing I would do is I would take everybody through the equipment maintenance and I would make them do all the maintenance plan on brand new equipment. And they were like, but but it's brand new. It doesn't need to be maintained. I'm like, 
before we do anything, I want you know, I want you to know what the entire maintenance process is for this equipment and how to do it properly. Now is the time to ask questions before we run the equipment. I want you to understand how to break it and fix it. <laughs> and so I would be there in my white lab coat and my white shirt, and I'd be crawling underneath the tank and taking it apart. And we happen to have four machines side by side, and I would do one, and I had three operators I would do training on the other three. So we would do all four side by side simultaneously. I would do one show, and then and I would tell what I was going to do. I would show them by doing it myself, and then they would do it, and I would show them how they did it wrong. But I would wait for them to make a mistake, so we had that teachable moment. That that maintenance training is really important. And then the last part, and this is something nobody ever really likes to do, cleaning. If you have any kind of an automated process that's working with raw materials, this is a cleaning operation. So 3D printing, you have all those fines that deposit in the bottom of the machine. How do you clean those out when you go from one lot to another lot or if you switch materials? If you have some sort of a liquid material that's going to fuse or if you have a 3D printer that uses resin, that's a liquid bath that you fuse with a laser. There's so many different types of equipment that are going to have cleaning required. And you have to think about how am I going to clean this equipment? Let's say you have a three, three axis or four axis or five axis CNC machine. How do you clean that machine out? You don't want to have, uh, oh, we, we machined aluminum in here and now we're going to switch over to titanium and you don't want to leave all that stuff behind. How are you going to clean the machine out? How are you going to get rid of all that material? If you're making, um, let's say you're making poly, uh, ultra high molecular weight polyethylene inserts, you can't use those machines for anything but that because you'll never get the machine clean again. <laughs> so some things it's not even possible to clean uh, because the it's nice and pretty and white and you machine a, a black uh, metal on there with machining machine working fluids on it. It's never going to be a clean again. You're never going to get a clean white polypropylene part out of that part, that machine again. So you need to understand cleaning validation. So those are the four parts of IQ. It's not just about how do I plug the machine in? Yes, you have to worry about riggers. Yes, you have to worry about electricians. You have to worry about plumbers. All those matter, but it's the full installation. Think about all the gardening, the safety, the space, the floor. Does it have enough strength? Uh, guarding, light curtains, that stuff. Hazops. All that stuff comes into play. Calibration. That matters. What is your frequency? Do you have the material, the, the niche traceable standards to do the calibration? If you have a laser welding machine, do you have the, the optical device to measure the output of the laser? And do you have training procedures that tell people you need to turn down the, the power on that so you don't fry the thing when you do the laser calibration? If you have the intensity up too high, it just fries it. <laughs> and now you got to buy another one or have it repaired. Um, so that's that's part of calibration is teaching people how to do the calibration, having the right calibrated uh, calibration devices. The maintenance, you need a procedure. It needs to have a schedule. It needs training. People need to know how to do that. And I talked about, you know, hands-on training for people. Before you even run the equipment, make sure they know how to maintain it. And then last but not least, the cleaning. And everybody likes to forget about cleaning, but cleaning matters in medical devices. We want nice, pristine parts, particularly if we're making implants, which a lot of these 3D processes, some are making instruments, but some are making implants that are 3D printed. And if you're making a 3D printed implant, you want those to be pristine because they have to have the ability to pass um, the endotoxin testing and the bio burden testing so you can sterilize those parts. That's really important. So after we've done our IQ, do we jump to OQ? No. Now, before we even jump into the OQ, the first thing we want to do is do that risk analysis. Do a PFMEA, a process failure modes and effects analysis. Identify all the hazards of the process. Any variability of the process has to be defined. Evaluate what is the impact of all that variability or hazards of the process, and then implement risk controls. And you might in your development of the manufacturing process, try different methods until you find out what works. Now, if you're doing a 510K submission, you can submit a production equivalent that's not on an automated process that's validated. And then as part of your design transfer, after you've submitted your 510K, but before it's cleared, before you commercially launch, 
then you automate the process and validate the process. And now you have commercial pro product and you validated that it produces the same output as the um, production equivalents, or you're gonna do a device modification because you've changed the product enough that the val old validation parts and the design validation don't count anymore. And you have to do an update. Um, sometimes it's a letter to file, sometimes it's not. It depends on what the changes are. Uh, sterilization process change, you went from steam to gamma, resubmission. So keep that in mind, there might be a need to do a special 510K for a significant process change because you introduce new risks. Once you've identified all the risk controls that are gonna be put in place, so what am I gonna monitor? What are gonna be upper and lower control limits or just upper limits or just lower limits? How frequently am I gonna measure that? What statistics am I gonna apply? Are there gonna be automated methods for measuring it? What batch records am I gonna fill out? Am I gonna do automated data collection? What tools am I going to use for measurement? What's going to be my uh, risk control plan, my inspection plan, my work instruction? All that? all that has to be done before you can even do your PQ. <laughs> yeah, because you have to fill out those forms. To You have to show that these are our process control, controls and here's the data. So you can't validate the process and then come up with the controls. No, you have to come up with the controls first. You have to come up with what forms am I going to fill out, what inspection that has to be done, what equipment needs to be used, what are the upper and lower control moments, what's my acceptance criteria. All that's supposed to be figured out before you get to your PQ. That's what the OQ is all about. The OQ is taking, okay, I've installed the equipment correctly. I know it works. I've done a risk analysis and I've figured out what factors matter in making a good part. Now I have to design the controls and set the limits. And so the OQ is trial and error, testing out different risk controls, seeing what works, seeing what doesn't work. And ideally you want to, in your OQ, push the boundaries beyond what works. So you actually get some failures. Yes, that means you're gonna scrap some parts. Oh, well, that's part of development. You're gonna scrap some parts. You make some good parts, you make some bad parts, you figure out where your limits are. How high can I go in temperature? How low can I go in temperature? How high can I go in pressure? How low can I go in pressure? What is the feeds through the CNC machine? Um, how, if I'm doing 3D printing, how fast can it go back and forth like this? How, um, how small can those slices be? Can I build bigger ones and still get the resolution I need? Or do I have to build smaller layers to get the resolution I need? If I'm building a new material, maybe I have to look at the particle size. If I'm using something like the nylon cord that's in these 3D printing machines, what diameter of that cord would work? They didn't just magically say, oh, this works one millimeter diameter for this nylon cord. That'll work on this big spindle. And just out of the box, it worked perfectly. They tried different sizes to find out what was the best mix of getting a part built in a certain amount of time, but still having the resolution that customers wanted. And if you need something that's a higher precision, what you might come up with is, let's get a new novel spindle, same material, but different spindle that has a different diameter of cord. So I can, uh, yes, I'm gonna have to build up layers that are smaller, but I'm gonna get higher precision that way. And I can get a better resolution of the 3D model when I'm done. Those are the kind of things you learn in process validation. So just buying an off the shelf machine, yeah, you can do that. And we can validate that. But if you've got something novel that you've developed your own IP technology on, you might have to do some of this design of experiment. And yeah, there's a chapter in the book in design of experiments. Yeah, it's in there. That's something you will have to do for a novel process. No doubt about it. But you need to figure out what the process parameters are. You're going to have to design experiments. And believe it or not, you can do statistically designed experiments. So uh, Plackett Berman box designs. Yeah, it's been like 25 years since I've done one, but I still remember how you design it. You have different variables, and some of them you keep, uh, you go with a high number and a low number, and you skip them, and you build a, uh, a 3D matrix of what this will look like, and you come up with a response curve, and you optimize it for one variable and say, okay, if I have this variable and this variable, that gives me my optimum number, and that's what I want, and here's my, you know, my acceptable window, so it tells me what my X and Y variables can be, and I keep Z constant. 
that's how you design these statistically designed experiments to optimize your variables. So you're going to have to learn some statistics to properly validate a brand new process that nobody's seen before. You're going to have to look at raw material specifications. I just scratched the surface when I said, what is the diameter of that nylon cord that's going into the 3D printer? But think about it. What is the melt flow? What is the tolerance on it? What is the uh, ductility and flexibility of that cord? Um, you know, what additives are in that nylon? It, does it have a colorant or not? Which vendor can it come from? Uh, there are so many variables in plastics that I can play with. They're going to change the, the functionality of that final product and the functionality of the process. I need to have a pretty tight raw material spec for automated processes so I can get that kind of consistency. And if I'm working with a polyurethane, like pelthane or something, variability all over the place for something like Ticoflex, but I go to another material like pelthane, it might run much more smoothly and I might not have the melt variability. Um, did you know that? Probably not. <laughs> so this is why you need to really dial in a raw material specification. You go talk to a mechanical engineer about titanium, they're going to tell you what the differences are between the different metallurgies. Like, you know, is it going to be Eli titanium or is it going to be something else? Is it going to be forged? Is it going to be machined? Is it going to be cast? And think about all the variabilities in the casting process. There are six single black belts that have been issued for just optimizing a casting process for one mold. <laughs> no change in design at all, just changing, optimizing the parameters for casting titanium implants. Let's say it's a uh, the raw material blank for a knee implant that we're going to polish. Or maybe they automated the polishing process and they're doing automated tumbling. Those are things that people have spent entire black belt uh, certification programs on optimization. So you might have to do some work. Operating procedures. You need procedures for these. That's part of the validation that should be done during the OQ before you get to PQ. You don't do your PQ and then write your procedure. You write your procedures during the OQ, and then you identify any deviations that were made, and those go in the deviations for your report. Like, we had a procedure, we made a deviation, we're going to update the procedure, that would be okay, but you justify it. Or, that's not okay, we revise the procedure, we approve the procedure, we repeat the validation. You decide. Training. Yes, you have to train the operators who are going to do this. So having the engineer that wrote the procedure is a bad idea. They're not going to make the product. They know the equipment way too well. They've made every mistake there is, and they're going to say, oh, that's okay. Well, when it's done by an operator that, that didn't invent the process and didn't design the device, it might not be okay. So do not have the engineer that wrote everything execute the OQs and PQs. Um, they could maybe work side by side with an operator on the OQs, but PQs make sure it's production personnel. So it's real world simulation here, not the engineer that knows everything. Um, they know too much and they're biased. Make sure an operator that's going to run it day to day is the person doing the PQ execution. And then process monitoring. You want a printout, whether it's an electronic output or it's a, it's a paper-based printout. Um, you know, like old sterilizers, they'll have a little strip like you would have from a, a, a register, a cash register. It'll give you a little printout of what the temperature was, what the pressure was, what the hold time was. Give you all the process parameters as an automated output of process parameters from the machine. Well, do you have that for your novel process? No, you got to come up with that from scratch. What is going to be all the process parameters for this? So are you going to write them down manually? Are you going to output them? Are you going to have it data logged? Are you going to have it saved on a computer somewhere? Are you going to have alarms that pop up for the operator telling them there's something wrong with the process? All that stuff you got to figure out when you're developing a new process. And then, and only then, do you get to the PQ, and we're looking at repeatability, reproducibility, lots of lot variability, process capability, so that CPK process capability coefficient, uh, that I talked about in some of our um, blogs and our, I think I also talked about in an earlier live session. you got to figure out what, what parameters do you have the process capability you need and which ones fall short and you need to optimize further. And those would be also the ones that you might want to inspect more. So you might have an AQL that's much tighter for the CPK that's not as good. And then process acceptability. That should be based on what is the acceptable design criteria, upper and lower limits, What's acceptable? You define that up front, 
and approve it in a prospective protocol, not after the fact once you know what the results are. The FDA won't buy that. So you have to have a prospectively approved validation protocol with acceptance criteria before you even start. So that's what's included in validating a brand new process from scratch. It's a ton of work, but you could pay somebody like me thousands of dollars to write a protocol for you for a process that I know but if you've developed brand new intellectual property, number one, it's a trade secret. Keep it internal. Number two, you need to properly validate it and you will learn something in the process of validation. I guarantee I always learn something. Every time I did validation, I learned something I didn't know before. So do the validation yourself, develop the experiments yourself, write the protocols yourself. If you need help, that's what consultants are out there for, but do your homework. Don't ask them what is an IQ, what is an OQ. Read the book first. And you'll know the basics, and then you can ask more intelligent questions, and you're getting your money's worth out of that validation time. Uh, one last thing for those of you that were good enough to watch till the very end, I'm giving you a little bonus. I have just put in on our website a brand new discount code, but it only applies to the process validation procedure. So if you don't have a process validation procedure and you want one, there's a 50% off code until May 22nd. Um, I chose that day because that's when I get back from a trip. Um, so if you want to put in the code, it's live, L-I-V-E, and it only applies to process validation. So there's my thank you for those of you that watch our live performance. And if you know somebody that needs a process validation procedure, share it with them. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.